That's a pretty fancy violin that you're holding. Thank you. Blake? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Blake. Hi. What is this? What is this? It sounds incredible, and you sound incredible. What? Oh, thank you. What is? What is? It this? is this gorgeous um, 1729 Granary Del Jesu. Fantastic. Yeah. How long have you been playing this violin? I think since 2015. So. Oh wow. If my math is like correct. eight years. Eight years now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had it for eight years. And That's so. You really uh, know this violin. I do. Yeah. It's. I. It took. I mean, you know, like with, I'm sure everyone says with these fiddles, like, I think what's so interesting is you, you pick them up and you play them for the first time and they sound good. Like, obviously, like that's what we're drawn to about them is they sound good. But I think what I have enjoyed is that every, it never gets easier. And I don't mean that in the sense of it gets easier to like, you know, violin just absolutely never gets easier. But it's, there's always something I'm figuring out about it, and it's changing. I mean, it's almost 300 years old. Yeah. And I find that as it changes, as I change, um, I adapt to the violin differently. I always feel like I can do more with it, you yeah. know? which is super interesting. And so, yeah, because after eight years, like, I'm still finding out things about it and discovering, you know, perhaps physical limitations that affect the violin that I'm kind of having to learn to maneuver. So where are you coming from? What, what were you playing before this, this violin? Before this, I played a seraphin. Sancta um, seraphin. You sang to seraphin, yeah. Venetian, right? Abs yeah. Uh, yes. And it was, that was a great fiddle. I really liked it. Um, but it was very bright. It was very Strad-like. In fact, they thought it was a Strad for a long time when they didn't have the label. Uh -huh. um, it, it was incredibly vibrant and projected really, really well. Um, and then before that, I was playing on a Gatano Gata when I was very young. Um, he was a pupil of um, Scarampella. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also like a good, that was a great fiddle for me to like kind of figure out I wanted to do this as a vocation. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, so that was the, the violin that you decided, like while, while you were playing it, you said, I think I, I want to do that. Yeah, that was the violin that I was like, I think I. That was the gateway violin. Yeah, that was the gateway drug. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then and then I played on a seraphim for very little. I, I think I only played on that for like a year and a half or something. And then. Um, and then I was, I got this. So you had a, yeah. a nice line of, of really nice instruments. Totally. But then this is like, this is a pretty special violin. Absolutely, yeah. Um, how did you come to have it in your yeah. session? Yeah. So um, I'm Canadian. You know, so um, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, uh, in Canada, we have um, a lot of subsidy, like art programs and government funding yeah. for the arts. And in Canada, we have a thing called the um, Canada Council for the Arts. Right. And they have this program called the Musical Instrument Bank. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it's a collection of, I think there's about 12 violins. Um, they have three strads, um, they had a Del Jesu. And uh, they have a they have a scarampella. They had a guadagnini for a while, a montagnana. Um, you know, a bunch of great fiddles. Was, was that started by the cellist Dennis Broad? That was. Yeah. You absolutely got it. Um, started by um, yeah. Yeah. he. Yeah, yeah. He he had a very much a, a hand in kind of the facilitation of this kind of idea of uh, creating a musical instrument loaning program with government um, kind of covering some of the costs and stuff like that. But it was like a really, it was a, a lot of people that kind of came together to create this yeah. concept. But yes, you absolutely nailed it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, and basically I, you audition and when you, uh, they give you like a ranking. And so obviously there's like 12 violins to pick from. So there's 12 winners or 10 or whatever. And whatever your ranking is, you, ha you have like your pick of the litter essentially. So, um, you know, if you're first, pick you get to choose from all 12 violins and you take one and then second rank comes in and chooses from the 11 wow et cetera, et cetera. it's like survivor it's like survivor that's yeah. it um and they tell you your number and they tell you your number oh, yeah wow. they give you a you do the audition well you send a tape and then after the tape um they come in and uh they give you they give you like a phone call and they're going to tell you like what your ranking is or like what the judge's pick was and so the first time i did it i was very fortunate that i was the um first pick so i got my first pick of of everything uh -huh. um and i chose this 
uh, you know, the, a couple days before the competition, they allow you, they give you an hour to try all the fiddles because they tell you like, you know, whatever your rank is going to be, um, you should have your own kind of list um, and, and put them in order of what your preferences are so that if you get a call and say you were, you know, sixth, if you go in that room and there's only six violins left, you know which of those you want because you only have 15 minutes to choose. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> that's so stressful. Kind of. I think that, um, I mean, well, yes, it is a stressful thing, but I was lucky that I was the first rank, so I had any choice. And did, did, you, did you have like the word on the street is, get the Del Jesu? Kind of. I think it's definitely, we, everyone kind of knew that like this was really, really special. Um, but also myself, I mean, I tried um, all three of the strads. I tried the Guadagnini. I tried everything. Um, and I liked this the best. I really liked the sound, the quality. There was something really dark and um, just luxurious about the sound. Now, you, know? you were telling me the other day that like, we were having a conversation about, you know, between strads and, and Del Jesus. Uh -huh. um, can, can you characterize that difference again? Absolutely. So, um, in my opinion, I think a, from what I've heard, a lot of people share this, but for me personally, um, Stradivarius is really the good ones. Um, kind of, I think, what they're most notorious for is their projection and their ease of execution. I find that a lot of strads, they make a lot of sound really easily, and they're really clean, almost like a laser beam. You know, they just, those, some of those golden period strads, I mean, they're really quite impressive to hear um, what they can accomplish in a giant room and in a concert hall. Um, but what I've found from playing strads is that you really don't have to work so hard with them, and that's kind of the challenge of playing on them, is that you really have to figure out um, how to back off and how to kind of figure um, the nuance of, of kind of smaller sounds and other things. Um, but they just really project. Um, but I also find that because of that, the, the sound is quite uniform the whole time. Whereas with Del Jesus, which I, I know from talking to other of colleagues who, who play on them as well, that we find that the Del Jesus is the kind of opposite. You really have to dig into it. You really have to lean into the sound and really lean into um, manipulating kind of the textures that you want, um, which to me is actually, I find it more difficult because I, what I've, the strads that I've played on before, I've found like, wow, I mean, I can just sing on this and it's just like, I feel like I'm not doing anything. But of course, that also may come from the fact that I've been, I might be biased because I've been playing on Adele Jesu for so long that mm. a lot of things seem easier. Um, but this one in particular, I find that I really have to learn how to dig into it because um, I find that sometimes making sound on it, um, if you, so it can almost be like skating over the strings. Like sometimes it can be almost whispery. So you have to really figure out how to, to make a quiet sound that's still full. You, you have to figure out just the right amount of balance and pressure from the bow. Yeah, so this is like the gateway to viola. That's it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is the gateway to viola and viola is the gateway to quitting. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, Burn. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but this is, this definitely there is a similarities and I think that's actually why I, it, the few times I have tried playing on viola, yeah. um, I like it because there is that kind uh -huh. of, that same kind of um, effort. Yeah. That is really interesting, yeah. But, um, but no, and so I, I think that uh, automatically, you know, like I said, because I had the first pick of the litter when I was doing the competitions, what, was, what it drew me to this was the fact that I felt like I could experiment so much and really lean into it, which in those moments in stage, you know, when you're playing Shostakovich concerto or, you know, Brahms, and you're in front of 100 people, I mean, it is just, it's so fun to just belt it out. And it gives back, yeah. Yes, exactly. So yeah, so I, uh, I was very fortunate that that happened. Um, and then after, you know, your contract is three years, and then I had to um, give it back for about a month, and then I did the competition again, and then once again, I was very fortunate that I was the first rank, so I got to pick it again. And then, um, the, so the, the, the way that the competition works is that all those instruments are in the council, um, but they're in the council from private loaners. They're all owned by individual people or by couples. Um, the government does not own them. The government has them in this program and then facilitates the loans to people. Okay. So this instrument is actually owned by a um, private couple, an anonymous couple, and they um, 
through other facilitations, decided they were so kind of pleased with what I was doing with the instrument that it is no longer part of the program, but is now loaned to me. Just oh, exclusively. Wow. Yeah. Yes. So yes. You, so you have it. You have it for a while. I, from what I can tell, a, a while. Yes. So you have. Not, yeah. You have survived. I have survived. <laughs> yes. I am still on the island. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a, a, a survivor of violin rotary. That, that's yes. really. That's. But that's a fantastic story. Yeah. It? Yeah. It's. And I mean, I'm so grateful to them. I mean, they are, an insanely generous people. And I mean, this is. I th it's been really nice for me to also explain, you know, because one of the, the benefits of this government program is that it allows people like me to get an opportunity to try a rare instrument um, without, you know, doing the kind of uh, climbing of, of people and personalities in order to kind of get their hands on one. Um, however, when someone like me that it's completely changed and influenced my entire career, um, you know, people have to give them back. And that's also very difficult. And I'm really grateful that being able to actually, you know, talk to people that own these instruments and when they see the impression it makes on your career and the difference it can make having an instrument like this, um, I've been so happy that they've been so generous and responsive into furthering to assist in that. Yeah. Um, and being so receptive to what it's done for me. And I just, they're, unbelievably you know laudable people and i i am just yeah beautiful really happy yeah um yeah. do you mind playing a few notes oh no of course yeah. oh <laughs> how's my form it's good <laughs> I'm an Aquarius. <laughs>